Well, guys, I got to tell you, I decided to be biblical this morning and come to you in the weakness of my flesh, me and the Apostle Paul. Um, that's kind of a joke, but anyway. Um, I, I woke up this morning and my voice is really a bit of a struggle, but here's what I know. I know God gave me a word for you. So if I know it, and so if you guys can put up a little bit of raspiness, I'm going to do this thing, all right? Turn with me to Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. But they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. <clears throat> Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all the day long. Now here in Psalm 25, David is very transparent, King David, and he shares his challenges, but he also expresses his firm belief that God always has a plan to bring about ultimate victory. I preached the other week, and all things God works together for good, right? David had that, and he understood it. And so in this psalm, he kind of reminds the Lord, uh, I'm your guy, Lord, I'm your, I'm your man. And he says over and over and over to the Lord, Lord, you're the focus of my hope. And if we jump down to verse 21, he actually ends this by saying, may integrity and righteousness protect me because my hope is in you. Now, some of your versions say, I wait for you. Uh, truthfully, the word hope and wait there in the Hebrew scriptures gets translated either way in your English Bibles a lot. Uh, it's kind of like Spanish. If some of you guys speak Spanish, know the word esperar is both hope and wait. It's actually quite true as well in, in Hebrew because, frankly, in all hoping, there is waiting. Alexandre Dumas, the French author, said it this way. All human wisdom is contained in these words, wait and hope. Humans must have hope. We have to live with an expectation of good to come. Hope is why people get up in the morning, why we get dressed, why we make breakfast and we go somewhere, all of us. Even atheist humans cease to function without something that they're hoping for. We hope for a future that we choose to believe in. Without hope, people stop. Most people hope and work for a future for their children, right? We're wanting to provide that our children's lives will be better after us. All societies, humans do this. Even the most base of societies, we work for a future, don't we? And when hope departs from you, that is the very definition of depression. When you have nothing of hope, your desire to live ends. Some of you have been through seasons of life like that. Hope is a required element in all humans. It's a very tangible thing. The question is this, where do you place your hope? Some people put their hope in being recognized at being good at something. They motivate themselves daily with a desire to be recognized, to live out their dreams. Some people put their hope in building a great name. Some people put their hope in wanting to be loved, to be valued, to have someone. They hope in human relationships for the meaning of their needs. Some people put their hope in acquisitions. They want a home. They want that new toy. They have their mindset on that next thing they want to get. Right? They dream and hope of things that they will someday acquire. Some people hope to build wealth. They hope for security. They hope to control their future. They hope in money. Some people put their hope in future experiences, younger generation especially. They're more driven and motivated by experiences than the older generations were. People dream of places they want to go. They have that bucket list of experiences they want to have. And so they motivate their lives dreaming of the items on the bucket list. 
Some people have hopes that appear more spiritual, but really sometimes they're rooted in ambition and they're uncertain as well. I mean, you can dream of building a great ministry, but God's plan for your life may be more simple than that. And besides, even if you build a great ministry, great ministries fade. God raises up one generation and then he raises up another in each and every generation, doesn't he? Most of the time, when we use the word hope, what you mean is this, the desire for something good in the future. You might say it this way, I hope that my son will be able to be home for Christmas, or I hope the weather is going to be nice this weekend, or I hope the doctor has good news for me. <clears throat> Children say, I hope to get lots of presents this year, or I hope to get picked for the part of the play. Or when they're a little older, I hope to be accepted into the college I want to go to. Or I bought the ring, I hope she says yes. And in all these cases, hope means a desire for something good in the future. And the basis for which we believe that this desire may be fulfilled. But there is something that all of these hopes also have in common. Uncertainty. You don't know for sure your son's going to make it home for Christmas. You can't control what the doctor is going to say. Your kids may hope for it, but they can't be sure that they're going to get what they want for Christmas. Every human hope carries with it an element of uncertainty, doesn't it? You may build a great name or you may fail at building a great name, but even if you build a great name, reputations can fall in a night by a single mistake. It's called cancel culture. Wealth and success may elude, and even if it's acquired, fortunes disappear overnight every day in this world. Security in life is fleeting, and hope placed in it is uncertain hope. Experiences may disappoint or even never materialize. She may say no, guys. All human hope is uncertain hope. You know, ordinarily, when we talk about hope, we're admitting to that uncertainty, aren't we? But there is another kind of hope that we see in the pages of Scripture. The biblical concept of hope is not just a desire for something good in the future. Biblical hope is a confident expectation that something good absolutely will happen in the future because it is based on God's promises. Biblical hope not only desires, it expects. And not only does it expect it, it is certain that it will happen. That's biblical hope because God is the guarantor. He is the certainty that what he says will be. So the question I have for you this morning is where is your hope placed? I think people of faith need to ask themselves that question because only when you place your faith properly can you be assured of confident expectation any other hope can be taken away. The one you think can't be taken away. It can be taken away. Psalm 42, one of the sons of Korah says, Why are you so cast down, O soul? And why are you so disquieted within me? Hope in God. And yet I will praise him, my hope and my God. The psalmist, who in this case is a son of Korah, cries out, and he recognizes his own heart, mind, and emotions are fixed on the wrong thing. And he reminds himself that he needs, that the reason he's fearful and the reason he's anxious is that he is trusting in the wrong thing. So he says to his own soul, hey, put your trust in God. Without a doubt, one of the most unique hopes in all of history was the hope of the nation of Israel. 
All of Israel, of course, were the descendants of one man named Jacob. And they numbered in the millions. And what they shared in common was a hope that had been handed down from father to son and mother to daughter. The hope of a coming Messiah. The hope that there would be change. The hope that somehow their trials were, would end and their people would be lifted up over all the earth because of the honor of bringing forth the greatest king of all. The promise was first truthfully given in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve, those first two humans, sinned by eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we don't fully understand it, but what we do know is that their DNA was corrupted. And it became infused with the very nature to sin. It's why you struggle. It's why I struggle. We have a sin nature, don't we? Something's wrong with those of you who didn't say amen. But in that moment in which mankind's hopes were dashed, God promised the woman something, that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. And that hope was handed down from generations and generations. And it was kept alive by faithful people of old and prophets like Isaiah who said, for unto us a son is born and unto us... A child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. Not just an earthly government, a kingdom that goes way above and beyond in a greater authority than any human kingdom ever known on earth. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, and to uphold it. That promise was held on to by Israel for 750 years until one early morning, the night sky split open and there were heavenly hosts singing and they said, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Christos, the King, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the King of all kings. The one who healed the separation between God and man. Who took the punishment that you and I deserved. And he declared, you are innocent. I don't care how you feel. He declared, you are innocent. In him, the hope of all eternity is placed. And we will remember it on Christmas. He did it. That's the thing about hoping in God's word. <clears throat> God God delivers what he promises every time. Hebrews 6 says it this way. When God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, which is impossible for God to lie. Did you get that? Impossible. We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope. Followers of Jesus have a very unique hope. It's not dependent upon any circumstance that happens in your life. Hope that is based upon circumstances can be taken away. But hope that is based upon eternal promises of God Something promised to you by God cannot be taken away. Men did not give it. Men cannot take it away. And the motivational hope in your life, the thing that makes you get up in the morning, the thing that gives you hope, it matters what it really is. Because it's the difference between living in joyful hope and living in ups and downs all the time, depending upon your circumstances. I really like to pay attention to Paul's prayers. Every now and again, he'll say in his epistles, I'm praying for this, I'm praying for that. I always like to zone in on it. One of them is in Ephesians chapter 1 where he says, Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus, the glorious Father, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation. You guys have heard me pray that one a lot. 
so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of the glorious inheritance in the saints, his incomparable power for us to believe. Now, Paul did not assume that the Ephesian believers were just going to get it because they were there and because they had believed and they were in the church. On the contrary, he assumed they wouldn't get it if they didn't have a spiritual eye opening. So he prayed for his disciples that they would be able to grasp the hope. Now, if they needed it, I submit to you that you and I probably need the same spiritual eye opening. We need God to show us how awesome this thing really is. Because I don't believe our brains are quite capable of wrapping around it. We don't understand how glorious eternal hope is. Do you want to know why there are way too many days in which you and I lose our joy? Because your hope and my hope was misplaced. All anger and frustration in our lives are the result of unmet expectations. We had expectations. They weren't met. Well-placed hope will get you through the darkest circumstances. Because when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, when he's with you, you do not fear evil. Your hope isn't based on your circumstances. It's based on eternal promises. I mean, how do persecuted Chinese Christians get thrown in jail for preaching the gospel, get beaten, get abused, spend years in prison, and walk out, and the day they walk out, they start preaching the gospel again. How do they do it? Because their hope wasn't based on circumstances. Their hope was based upon the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the eternal promises of God. And they don't lose their joy. When I think of hope in darkness, I can't help but think of Okari Timboom. Some of you remember her. Her story was that when the Nazis began rounding up the Jews of Holland, the Ten Boom family became active in the Dutch underground. And as Christians, they could not stand idly by. And so they started hiding Jews from the Nazis. And when their efforts were uncovered, Kari Ten Boom and her entire family were sent to the death camps. Few people in history have understood the depths of human depravity like Kari Ten Boom and the awful conditions of that Ravensbrook camp. She saw evil that few people see and live to tell. She lost her entire family. Her father died first, then her sister Betsy was cruelly worked to death. Corey saw people turned into animals, men doing unspeakable things for a scrap of bread. She had every expectation of death, but through a clerical error, she was accidentally released. And she lived to tell her story. If you've never read the book or seen the movie, it's been out many, many years ago, The Hiding Place. I do recommend it. But my favorite quote from Corey Ten Boom is this. There is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. David said it this way. If I descend into the depths of the pit, you are there. Because hope that men do not, does not, doesn't give you is hope that cannot be taken away. Is your hope really in what can't be taken away. I've, I've lived a blessed life, and I have known believers all over the world. I have met some of the greatest men of God in our generation. I've been a part of revivals in various places all over the world. And I have met Christians from countless walks of life. And I've noticed that quite a few seem to express a lot of disappointments, frustrations, and a general sense of discontent in life. Yes, they're professing Christians, and yes, they come into church, and yes, they smile, but in everyday life, they will tell you they are more frustrated than joyful. And other Christians I've met seem to have joy all the time. There's people in this room who have joy all the time, joy and peace. 
It's like those believers just radiate a positive sense that something good is getting ready to happen whenever you see them. Hope shines in their faces, even when they deal with difficulties. And the truth of the difference between those who have joy and peace and those who are continually frustrated, the difference is one thing. Ready? Where's their hope? Is there hope in what they're going to get in the life they live today? Or is there hope in God? Are they looking for joy and peace in the things of earth? Or are they looking for it in their God? With, with that thought in mind, I want you to think about Jesus' words in Matthew 6, where he says this, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy or where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where's your treasure? Where's your hope? Where's your security? Can I just say it this way? Jesus didn't give us this passage so that pastors would have something to take up the offering by. In Matthew, this whole section of Matthew is the Sermon on the Mount, right? He's teaching us about the kingdom. He's teaching us about what it is to live in the kingdom and where to have your hopes and your future based. God doesn't want your money. He wants you to be free. He wants you to walk in peace. He wants you to walk in joy. He wants you to be at peace. He wants your heart set upon a hope that nobody and no circumstance can take away. The scriptures are full of proofs that just like the early church, we should place our hopes on eternal things that can't be taken away. Sometimes I think in our prosperous culture, we've forgotten this. Romans 15 says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Did you see that? Overflowing hope is the result of trusting in him, not in somebody, not in man, not in circumstances. God really wants his people to be living a life that is empowered by an overflowing anticipation of the amazing good future that he has for you. Looking forward to it. So looking forward to it that the look on your face, you cannot help but smile. Not hopeless, not worried, not frustrated, but aware that you have hold of something that is so remarkable, that is so amazing, that it overflows out of your life. That's the kingdom. God spoke to Isaiah. Why do you say and why do you complain? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't grow weary. His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary. He increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll soar on wings as eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. That Hebrew word there, same one we started with earlier this morning with David, is a Hebrew word, quava. And it literally comes from a root that literally is like a, it's almost like a cat waiting to pounce. It's such an anticipation that it's like, oh, there's something good there. I'm going to get it. That's hope. And just like in English, we have a, a noun, hope, my hope. Or you can say, I hope, and it becomes a verb. Likewise, in Hebrew, the, the noun version is one of my favorite words in Hebrew. It's the word tekva. It's the one that we find in a Jeremiah 29, 11, where he says, you know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. That's tikva. And tikva comes from a root word meaning a rope or a cord. And here's the picture. You got a rope or a cord in your hand. And it's stretching from you to somewhere in a misty, clouded future you can't see. 
And you can't see where it is, but every now and again, you can give a tug on it. And you go, oh, something's out there. And it's good. When he says, I give you a future and a hope, he says, I'm giving you something to hold on to. Guess which Old Testament writer uses that word more than any other? Job. When Job says, though he slay me, I will trust in him. Job says, I got something in my hand and I'm holding on to it. I ain't letting go. Because God promised. And I know his character. And what happened? God restored. God fulfilled his promises. It's funny, we read that passage all the time in Jeremiah 29, 11, You know the plans I have for you. <laughs> plans to give you a future and a hope. Some of you know what I'm going to say next. What we don't quote a lot is what, what was happening when he said that. The prophet was saying, you guys are getting ready to be conquered and to go into captivity for 70 years. Yep, your homes are going to be destroyed. You're going to be dragged off in chains. And you're going to serve a foreign king in a foreign land for 70 years. Circumstances are going to be pretty rotten. But I have a plan. And I have something on the end of this line. And it's going to go beyond your lifetime. Your children are going to be the ones who actually inherit it. See, hope, that's the thing about hope. Real biblical hope, it extends beyond our lifetime. I'm reminded of what it says in 1 Corinthians. These three remain, faith, hope, and love. See, just like love, love doesn't stop when you die. If you lost a loved one, did you stop loving them? No. No, love lives. Love remains. It lasts past us. It's one of the great comforts. In the same way, our hope, it, it can extend in great power past our own lifetimes. That's why it says in, in Hebrews chapter 11, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. They died before they even received the promises, but did they get the promises? Yes. Because he who promised is faithful and true, and he cannot lie. And so even though they didn't see it in this life, they saw it. They saw it. That is hope. Even death cannot stop you from inheriting God's promises. Biblical hope is a confident expectation that something absolutely good is going to happen because it is based on God's promises. I want to tell you that biblical hope is what is going to be required for you and me to build the kingdom of God. It's required for this church. We got to have vision. We got to look forward. If we're going to, if we're going to make a difference in Indian River County and in this nation, because without our hope being based on him, when we face opposition or hardship, which we will, how many of you know that whenever the kingdom is advancing, there's going to be opposition and hardship? In this world, you will have tribulation. <clears throat> Without that, or for that matter, pleasant distractions come along, we fade in our commitment. But those who hope on the Lord, who have a long-term, Lord, I know you've got this thing, they will never be put to shame because it is not within man's power to put you to shame. So we set our hearts on things above. You know, I talk to believers sometime and I have some pretty regular conversations that go something like this. John, I just, I don't believe that America can, there's no hope for America. We're too far gone. Guys, if you want a quick fix, we're not going to see it. If we look for short-term rewards, we're going to be impatient and forget that waiting on the Lord means, well, hoping means waiting, right? But when we have hope and we believe, Martin Luther said it this way. He said, even if I knew that tomorrow the world would fall to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. That's faith. That says, no, he is with us we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And if everyone else says, ah, the world ends tomorrow, 
I'm still planting a seed for the future because my hope isn't in man. It is in God. Are you with me? Would you stand? Last week I read this passage. For we know the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Friends, the best is yet to come. So let me ask you again, where is your hope? Are those foreign sounding words? They don't need to be. You can have your joy based on something that doesn't come and go, that can be completely assured and not taken away. The real Christian faith is not dependent upon your circumstances. It's not even dependent upon the blessing of life now as much as we enjoy it and as much as we thank him for it. Real faith was well expressed by the apostle Peter when he said these words, listen. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even though for a little while, if necessary, you're grieved by various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and honor and glory and revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you haven't seen him, you yet love him. Though you don't see him now, you believe him. And you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That, that's the hope. And that's the one you want. Don't settle for anything less. If you'll close your eyes for just a minute. You know, a lot of us celebrated Thanksgiving on Thursday and we're looking forward to Christmas and time with family, the holiday season. But for many, it is actually a very difficult time because of wounds, because of things that you've experienced in your background, and frankly, the pressure from seeing everyone else who look like they're in happy, normal families, whatever that is, and you feel like you're not. And if our hope for life is in warm moments with family and lots of presents and good food, Hope can quickly turn to sorrow in the holidays. But the real message of Christmas tells us about a different source of hope. It says that we hope in the truth that God sent his son into the world to experience our pain and our suffering with us and to lift us out of the rejection and out of the wounds and out of the disappointments in life and instead give us an eternal living hope hope that no man can ever take away from you. Death does not have the ultimate mastery. Would you be honest with yourself for a moment with nobody looking around? Do you really have that kind of confidence in God? Is your faith in God? Do you have that kind of relationship with him? If you don't, you can have that today. He doesn't like me better than he likes you. He will give to you today those same promises. If you'd like to receive that, would you just raise your hand? Because I want to pray for you. Thank you. There's several others here who would say, John, you know, I'm a believer. I love Jesus. But I have let too many things steal my joy. And I have put my hope in too many circumstances and situations. And I need to realign my heart to put my hope on things eternal. If that's you, would you raise your hand? All right. Just keep your heads bowed. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come on forward. And I want to pray for you this morning. Father, for those who raise their hands to receive you, Lord, I ask right now, 
You said that if we believe in our heart, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, and we believe in our heart that you have been raised from the dead, that we are saved. So today, Lord, upon the confession of their need, Lord, we choose to put our trust in you. Just tell him right now that you put your trust in him. And Father, for all of us here who have too often let our joy be stolen because we put our trust in man or circumstances or things temporal, forgive us, Jesus. Lord, let us fix our eyes upon you, the author and finisher of our faith. Help us today to put our hope in the things eternal. 